We look at music, we look at bands, artists, and especially music history through the coloured prism of our contemporary times. The, mus the, the people that made music a hundred years ago were human beings like us, uh, obviously. And uh, when we listen to that music, when it's great, it's because that music has managed to depict some sort of universal humanity that echoes through the ages. You know, if you listen to Bach, or you listen to, say, a Gregorian chant, or you listen to sort of African music, or you'd listen to, you know, Alan Lomax's recordings of, you know, Afro-American prisoners in the 1930s. If there is the collective humanity that that aesthetic points to, we would not be able to get anything from it. And sometimes the sort of local cultural things that bind that music um, puts it in a distance for us. But it's that collective humanity, the fact that we're all human beings and we all have similar interests and likes and dislikes and same problems. And to hear somebody from the 1930s on a blues record talking about situations and happenings which still echo for us now it, it it binds us all together as a species with our collective humanity we can all collectively agree on this aesthetic and of course aesthetics deal with quality um, we are trying to define what is good and what is not good and what is right and what is not right and that comes out of a negotiation between all of us you know, I may, I may think that, um, you know, the Mavish Junction is the greatest band and I may think that everybody should be forced to listen to them every single day. Everyone should be forced to sit down, whether they like it or not. It will be good for them to hear the Mavish Nuxture. And I think they should be forced in school, preferably, when they're very little, about the age of five, they should be tied into their chairs and pommeled with the whole of dream off the side two of between nothingness and eternity. I think that's right. And then people turn around and go, no, Andy, I don't think you're right. Well, I do. I do think you're right. And there's a negotiation that goes on. And the collective overrules my idea. But there might be some utility in that idea. They need to try it out. I'm sure the world will be a better place when the whole, all those kids have been indoctrinated in the belief that the Mavish Doctor are the greatest band in the world. Now, um... That type of indoctrination is going on all the time. We educate our kids in that way. So we have to negotiate, you know, good stuff. If we're going to indoctrinate these kids, you know, at school and tell them what's right and what's wrong, you know, because school's not just about telling you facts. It's not just about truth. And truth is really about quantity. Quantity and quality, right? Those are the two things. We, that's at the way we look at the world, right? We measure stuff, you know. So, you know, when did um, William the Conqueror invade the UK? Well, you know, he invaded them in 1066. That's all about measurement. How do we know that? Well, we've looked in the records and we've read this and we've, you know, and we've used sort of a sort of an empirical method to determine that that's probably the case, right? As the great um, liberal philosopher Hume says, we don't know that that's the case. We don't, right? We never, we look through the prism into history, we look through this prism, which is coloured by the, the smoky um, veneer of the past, obscuring our view, but it's also coloured by the cultural view of our time. And that cultural view is a product of this um, negotiation, right? And that negotiation is ongoing. So as a musician and artist, I believe because, you know, I'm not religious in that way. I don't think morality and ethics and this negotiation is coming from some higher power. It could well be, but my argument doesn't change. My, my point is, is even if that's the case, the negotiation is going on in the arts, right? When you have philosophies that try and get into the area of what the arts do, it, I, I feel it always historically goes wrong, right? And this is a viewpoint that really drives the whole of my personal view of music history and music culture and different genres and their importance. Now, on this video, I want to explore that more because I'm very aware I'm, I'm making statements 
and people are pushing back to me and they're pushing back to me because they um, accept, and I have no problem with this, but they accept a certain ideology that is around today. And I'm questioning that ideology. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm questioning it, right? I am negotiating my way through it. And, and from my personal point of view, going, well, is that really the case? And it's some of those, is that the cases that I want to talk about on this video? Because I think anyone who's watches this channel, it might give you a clear idea of some of the, the concepts behind this channel. I don't just sit here to have a silly laugh and like make videos that are clickbaity so that people will you know, come them, you know, that's all a part of it and that's part of the negotiation. But this challenge is very postmodern in that I take that in a sort of Brechtarian way and I actually expose that to you in an ironic fashion. You know, I'm, I'm always referring to that in a sort of knowing postmodernist nod. Now, postmodernist, what the hell does that mean? That is a philosophical, philosophical point of view. And this is really what's important, a point of view that emerged in this sort of mid 20th century, it had come out of sort of critical theory, out of existential, existentialism, it had come out of the sort of phenomenology, phenomenology of people like Herschel and Heidegger. Um, it's a philosophy and it has an incredible utility. What does utility mean? Another philosophical concept, you know, it's the idea of the use of something. You know, the utilitarians were another bunch of philosophers that were, were related to the pragmatists, another bunch of philosophers. So this is Philosophy Sunday and I'm going to be talking about philosophy on here. And I'm going to be talking about my personal philosophy. Now, when you come to this channel, what you get is my viewpoint, right? My viewpoint is not um, set in stone and I hope I can change my viewpoint. I am in a negotiation. I read the comments, I have the feedback and if I feel I've got something... And it's not about right or wrong, it's about this negotiation. If I believe my viewpoint can be refined, and if that refining needs me to really, you know, wipe out huge parts of my ideology that I assume were correct, then I will do that. When I discuss a dogmatic ideology, these are people that aren't willing to do that because they've taken on an ideology in an almost religious way, and they're holding on to it, whatever, it can't be questioned. Now. I know full well where that comes from. And again, that comes from philosophy. So on this channel, I want to start with this idea that started at the top of this video, that um, we look at music history and music and the, the function and form of music through a prism which is coloured by the culture of our time. Now, we could start with two assumptions here, and you're going to be either assume one or the other. You're going to think that our culture is the best and our viewpoint of history is the best, that we have come to the right moral view of the world, right? And so um, if we go back in history and we look at um, when slavery was accepted and it was by the Western European world actually championed and it was justified, those people then didn't think they were doing anything wrong. They thought it was okay to have slaves, right? Um, and then philosophically things happened and suddenly the culture goes, no, it's not right to have slaves. That again is arrived at through philosophy and art. That I believe it starts off in the arts. You know, anyway, well, that's another discussion. So suddenly, culturally, we go, right, that's not right. And we look back at that time, we go, they, they got it wrong then. They got it wrong. But back then they would, would be looking through history. Those people who are reading the Bible and reading about slavery would have said, well, the, the Bible's talking about slavery, we think slavery is okay, and the Bible says it's okay. But now there's a, a, a different problem to anybody accepts the truth of the Bible, because the Bible in some cases seems to be accepting and championing in certain circumstances slavery, which we now, in our present climate, know, in inverted commas, is wrong. Now the question is, you either believe that we sit in a position where we're in a moral superiority to be able to judge it, or the fact is that, the, is that culture is in flux and there are always things in culture which at one point are seen as being okay and they're not. Now if that's the case, it means that in our contemporary culture there will be stuff that people believe ideologically which is actually wrong. And it's creating bad things to happen. In a couple of hundred years' time, they're going to look at this culture and go, oh my God, how could they believe that? 
How could they accept that? Why did they think that wasn't true? Why did they deny that truth? Why did they deny that logic? Why couldn't they see the sense of that? How could they morally um, you know, allow that to happen? That negotiation has to happen for our culture to be healthy, all right? Now, I believe, uh, and this is only my opinion, and you've come here for my opinion. If you don't want my opinion, go somewhere else, because that's all you're gonna get is my opinion. I am not philosophically a point person who believes that my opinion is ideologically 100% sound, right? I am here to negotiate it and I'm offering these opinions. You're welcome to question it in the uh, comments and I will push back. And if you come up with an argument that I cannot refute, I will adjust my opinion, all right? So um, when we look at the arts, the arts is the place where we make a negotiation. Now, I think fundamentally that negotiation is the negotiation between chaos and order. And it is my opinion, and this is my opinion, I've arrived at this after sort of 40 years of listening to music, studying philosophy, studying music. I, I, I became interested in philosophy in the 1980s when I went to art college. And at art college back then, postmodernist philosophy was the only one we were told about. And that was seen as a way of critiquing art. And I was very interested in it, and at, at the start, fascinated by it. And as I got into it, it didn't make sense to me. And I started to, you know, read other philosophies that countered that. And I started to go, well, this is not right. And very, very useful and interesting from an aesthetic point of view, you know, to believe everything is culturally constructed and there's no author, you know, and that uh, there's no, you know, um, objective truth. That's that existentialist view of the world is powerful for artists and it really embodies 20th century art. It's, it's, the, it's the prism in which that art was made. And we look back at that art with the, the view of our point now, because we're in a different cultural space, there's different ideologies, and we judge that art then on our contemporary view now. This is a, something I believe happens, right? And so when I became interested in postmodernist philosophy, I started to question, this started around about 1986. So I've got a good 38 years, nearly 40 years of looking into this. Now, I'm not a philosopher, I'm a drummer. I hit things, right? I'm not clever enough to be a philosopher, but I have a very strong interest in it. And um, I've always believed that if philosophy has any use, it will have a use to me. There's many philosophers I've read and I don't understand what they're on about. It's like, I'm not just too thick to understand this. But if it has no utility for me, if it just waffly, just, peep, you know, sounds like some French person with a beard and a pipe just looking clever to girls, which is what some of this postmodernist philosophy sounds like to me, or justifying their own questionable moral view of the world, and that's some of the postmodernist philosophy seems like that to me as well, then um, I am... I, um, that's my opinion. That's, that's, that's the point I'm coming from. And that opinion is not some modern cultural, I'm like on right wing and I'm, I'm just spouting um, the viewpoint of a certain faction of sort of racists and, you know, it's not come from that. This is a long negotiation that goes way back before these ideas hit the mainstream. I have watched these ideas hit the mainstream. I have seen the influence of postmodern modernism, which really gains a hold in the 1960s and first comes into sort of art criticism and the art world and then moves into the academy and starts to underpin the way we look at the sort of humanity subjects and now has moved into, you know, mainstream culture and is now being used within the media to make um, moral judgments and the media is pushing out. Because the media is always going to have to have a moral position. You know, they'll, they'll have all these things that will check the morality of the media. And uh, they, are, that will they will use the um, m morality of the time to do that. And what I'm saying is we need to question that morality. Because if in the wrong hands, that morality, and we see this in totalitarian societies, will be used by the media to control people, right? And uh, this is a very hot subject at the moment, especially here on YouTube. Um, I want to put that into context. I don't want to come here ranting about that. I want to come for my personal journey through art and philosophy 
I want to try and explain my position on this video. This is the heavyweight philosophy, philosoph I can't even say the bloody word, philosophy um, video on my channel. This is where I'm going to sort of um, state my intention and my position. So, um, I believe that art is the no negotiation between chaos and order. Now, the negotiation between chaos and order has also been a very important um, topic of discussion and thought for, in philosophy as well. Um, if we take something like music and we go back, say, 100,000 years pre-civilization, that culture would have had a certain attitude towards music that we don't know and we just don't understand and we can only guess at and we will try and guess at it through our contemporary prison but if you have some sort of communal you know hunter-gatherer society sat in a cave somewhere or whatever on their little village distrusting the people over the other side not understanding the universe with their own sort of um, magical way of seeing the world an explanation to what is going on um, with access to music and access to music um, in a way which would be magical communal um, would be seeming to hint at some realm that they would totally believe in this this must be music must have started off as a magical entity and it must have been involved in the sort of communal magical practices and music really fundamentally seems to have that aspect still and that's rooted in that period of time um, the greeks emerge and they start to um, look at the world in a different way they start to analyze the world using a sort of rational process and then suddenly you get some a mythical person like pythagoras who is really seeing music and the law of the octave you know the law of the triad He's seeing it as a, a way of understanding the very structure of the universe. So the music is being seen in a scientific point of view at that point. If we scoot forward to say, you know, um, the Middle Ages and we look at Gregorian chant, we now see music as having a, a religious, spiritual aspect, an uplifting, higher look. Now, um, this gazing up, again, is an idea that comes from philosophy. Um, before Plato and Aristotle and, um, oh, what's his name? The, uh, the <laughs> God. Before Plato and Aristotle, um, you have the pre-Socratic um, philosophers. So Socrates was the philosopher that escaped my... People like Democritus, who really saw the world in purely material way, that thought the world was just made out of atoms. Right, that guy got it right. He got it right years and years ago. Absolutely incredible. And then um, Plato, Socrates, and then Aristotle. And they start to look at this material world and they go, well, it can't be like that. And they come up with a couple of ideas that are sort of so hugely um, influential on our society that I need to mention them. Plato comes up with the idea of perfection, the perfect realm, that we are in this sort of fallen realm, right? But everything we do actually relates to a perfect realm somewhere else where you have these absolute forms, the idea of perfection, right? The idea that these things have fallen and we're in this sort of fallen realm. This is then taken up by Christianity and we have the idea of the fall in Christianity, right? Um, Aristotle then introduces this idea of of this upward motion of uh, intent, right? The world isn't just some random material place, but it's, 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 it's marching forward. Every process is marching forward upwards, you know? So if we, if we look at the universe, you know, we, you know, you get subatomic particles that become atoms. They become like, you know, through this, you know, the process of the early universe that, 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 um, then forms into compound elements, those elements come together, they form into like planets and they form into like rocks 
they become more complex compounds and we're moving up towards you know now we get trees and we get like you know little single-celled organisms and then frogs then we got horses then we got monkeys then you got human beings then human beings come up with art and music and they come up with like nuclear reactors they create elements that doesn't exist before they create the potential to destroy the world they create the potential to have another consciousness they invent other consciousness like the metaverse and what we've got is this process that is going up and it seems like we're moving up that is a point of view and that come, really comes from Aristotle and more to the point from a philosopher called Hegel. Now, you could be a materialist like Democritus and go, no, this is just all random stuff. This is just random stuff. You know, the fact that human beings, we're not the, we're not the, the, the logical end. And this is, like, this is like Darwin, this is like Hume, this is like Democritus, this is the other line in philosophy, which is just random, you know. It's like human beings emerge, you know. They do some stuff and then they'll probably blow themselves up and, you know, the universe will just carry on as it was before. It wasn't, you know, why, why do you think, why, why have the ego of thinking that human beings are at the top of this sort of tree, Aristotelian tree that's moving up to the point of human beings at the top of it? You know, why would you think that? But now, those two, those two philosophical ideas can be, you know, reduced to the idea of order which is this thing that the, the world has a point, it has a purpose, it is on a grid that is moving towards something, to a perfect real, realm, a utopian place where everything will be wonderful and we're moving towards that. Or you can just go, no, it's not like that, it's just chaos. You know, it's just chaos. This is just particles swirling around. Those are two ideas. Now, I am not coming down on either one of those because I think it's far more complex than that. But this... Philosophically, you go through history and philosophers are, are trying to deal with this and you get a point where um, this sort of materialist reason, right? And then this, this, this Cartesian idea that all we really know is that we exist, you know, I think therefore I am. That, that, get, that gets to a crisis point. And out of that comes an incredible thing. We have the Age of Enlightenment, and then the Age of Enlightenment then moves on to sort of a liberal, de de democratic. And we suddenly see this explosion. It's quite humbling to realise that a lot of the stuff that has made our lives really comfortable and made me able to talk to you on YouTube like this in real comfort, and I'm not out there just running away from a lion and trying to stay alive and, you know, get to the age of 30. A lot of those things emerged in just the last 250 years. Before that, it was all superstition and strangeness and madness, you know. But all this stuff came out of us becoming rational beings, you know. It came out of sort of this rational, sort of liberal, you know, idea, which is really has its roots in that, accepting that chaos, right, and, and, and adapting to it. Philosophically, we see a split at that point, when the alignment emerges and the alignment's underway and we, we, we are getting industry start to emerge, and once industry starts to emerge, which elevates the um, experience in a way for people, but also doesn't because it creates this sort of work, workers and they're having to work like seven days a week, you know, and then there's an elite above it which are milking up. Now all this starts to emerge. Um, and like I say, a philosopher counter to sort of that European logical rational materialist um, view philosophically you get Hegel emerged and uh, Hegel has this idea that he's taking this Aristotelian idea he um, has this idea of that uh, of we are in a historical process which has a spirit all right and that spirit is the embodiment of order. That, that, that history is actually trying to move to some utopian end. There's an intention there that moves it towards it. And um, that is motivated by reason. And reason is something that is, comes from God and it's like in, in us humans. It's reason is the thing that's driving us towards this utopian place. And he took the sort of Greek dialectic of thesis and antithesis, which creates a synthesis, and he saw that historically as coming from um, the idea of reason being the driving force, and then chaos, the antithesis of that was our passions, our desires. 
And he had this idea of the hero. The hero, sometimes their passions are in line with that motivation that comes from reason. And that moves, you know, um, uh, states, because this is really coming from the state. So he, he's almost like saying a state has a spirit. It has this vision, you know. This is something that, say, you would see in like Nazism, you know, that there is a state, there's a country, and it has its intention, and we are moving towards this utopian future. Now, that idea has, um, it is embedded almost in like this idea of the, the death cult, you know, and this comes out in many cults, you know, this idea that we are moving towards a utopia, and this, this really comes from Hegel, and this is why I have a problem with Hegel. Um, it, the the idea that we are moving to this utopian future and that future will be guided by the spirit of the state. So if you don't get with the program, you will be destroyed. You have to get with this program to get to that point. You know, and this is all based on spirituality and and, and ethical morality coming from God. Now, Karl Marx then emerges. And he's a Hegelian, but he's also a materialist. This is what's really interesting about Karl Marx. That materialism, which is at the other end, you know, the sort of liberal idea of just science and truth, and then, you know, what do we do about the arts? I don't know. We just deal with science and truth. You know, the technology, let's just build stuff and make people richer, and that's all it's about, you know. Marx was a materialist, but he was also a Hegelian. So he took that dialectic, and he came up with dialectic materialism. And that's the idea that this is happening, but it's happening on a material level. It's nothing to do about the spirit, a highfalutin spirit. It's, a, it's about um, the spirit is actually embed, embedded in these groups. We've got the bourgeoisie, we've got the proletariat, and they have a spirit. And that, that, that proletariat, now they're in this industrial you know, uh, complex will become aware. They will be motivated by their sense of reason towards realising their situation. And um, we, were, we are in this sort of revolutionary state, revolution meaning, you know, this cycle around history that Hegel had really identified. And, and Marx said, what's going to happen is we're on this point and we're at this point now, we're in this sort of capitalist world, but we are naturally going to evolve to the higher state of communism, okay? So um, we see that within the communists, towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, this didn't happen. They're walking around going, oh, God, I thought we were going to just, you know, Karl Marx naturally said we were just going to get there. Marx was a very wise guy. He was very incredible. His, his, his analysis of, of, of um, uh, you know, economics is, is brilliant. And I think there's flaws in there. You know, it's, it's his idea of value and what is valued, you know, just in pure monetary terms takes out the fact that, you know, things can have value, like a piece of art could have a value of like millions of pounds when it's just a bit of canvas. And, you know, because there's an idea embedded in that, um, the idea that people can swap stuff, it's, it, it would be really hard to explain why people swap stuff using sort of an, a Marxian economic you know, model. Um, but the real problem for Marx is the fact that it didn't happen. His prediction was completely wrong. It just didn't happen. It didn't happen naturally. And so at the beginning of the 20th century, this philosophical viewpoint that comes from Hegel through Marx, we now see this idea that we, we, need, we need to actually force this to happen. If we're going to achieve utopia, we're going to have to force it to happen. So you know, the, the, the Russian Revolution, the Leninism, that was one attempt to do it. Um, we can see um, later on out of critical theory. Now, critical theory is something that emerges at the beginning of the 20th century, around right about the 1920s. Before that, we have phenomenology. And phenomenology really um, tries to create truth categories out of subjective experience, which is something that I think is really difficult to do. There's nothing wrong with doing that. If you want to sort of say there's a truth in subjective experience, there's nothing wrong with that. But these ideas then sort of meld with critical theory. And critical theory was a, a, was a sort of European, came out the Frankfurt School, was a, a, a renegotiation of how you could ach achieve a sort of communist state. It was about looking at, you know, this is where we sort of get power structures and meta-narratives that come from those power structures and they, they create society. That then goes into the sort of um, uh, negation of truth categories of the postmodernists. I'm really going fast here to try and get to my point. 
um, um, you know, post ones going, oh, what is reality? You know, do we really have an opinion or is it just all constructed, you know, culturally? And if you mix, mix that with, you know, and then there's these power structures and they control everything, that's really what it's about. And they use control, so they use a meta narrative to control the people and keep them down there. And there's certain groups who are underprivileged because of this and that and that. And we, if you track all that through, you arrive at the sort of contemporary moral view that we have now, which is now mainstream. This isn't coming from weird French philosophers in the 1950s and 60s. This is now coming from our governments, it's coming from the media. This idea that these things are ideologically correct and can't be questioned. Now, I believe there's, there's a ton of utility in these philosophical ideas, but once they have been adapted, and you can see the cultural um, space that we are now exiting, this, which I'm going to call the rock and roll era. This starts around about 1962 and it runs alongside music. And this is why it's really important for this channel. Um, before that, he had the modernist idea. And the modernist was a sort of acceptance of a sort of much more liberal, Western, um, democratic view, materialist view of the world, you know. And this is where you get all these sort of scientific, you know, explosions and everyone becomes a cog in the machine inside this modernist world. And that's that modernist vision of the world, which sort of emerges sort of 1910, 1912. We see jazz and we also see Hollywood film. We see all those art forms that are really important linked to that as being a part of that cultural epoch. And then there's a sudden shift in the 1960s and rock and roll comes out of this sort of what I call the sort of postmodern epoch that we've gone through. And some of those postmodern ideas were so useful early on. And it's it, because it was questioning, you know, the value of things and the, and, and, and the, the voice of people, you know. Um, why have we got to listen to this elite? What about this person here? What about this blues musician in the 1930s? What were they singing about? Well, that's just, that's just like rubbish blues. It's just some Afro-American singing about rubbish, really. It was all sexual stuff and noddy stuff. No, listen to it. That's actually really useful. That's really incredible what they're doing there. That opening up of the world in, in the early 1960s, which is, is, is a product of post monarch modernism it's a product of phenomenology it's a product of all this way of seeing the world was incredibly useful and it gave a voice to so many people and that is why with the emergence of rock and roll it's tied directly in the emergence of afro-americans suddenly getting a voice of gay people getting a voice of women getting a voice you know of of, of other ethnic minorities suddenly getting a voice and that, with that new voice, new points of view coming, it informs the culture. And by the 1970s, you have this massive expansion within the arts. You know, the, the, the painting, literature, film has all changed. And it's just brimming with this incredible creativity, right? But these ideas are so useful that they, they, they start to be codified. They, could be, they start to become mainstream. They're so useful that people say they shouldn't really be questioned. shouldn't question this because it has... It has so much utility, it shouldn't be questioned. And also people come out and they expand on this and they start to push it ideologically to a point where it becomes sort of almost preposterous, right? And we're at a point where we have exited, a few years back, and it's been exacerbated by digital technology, we have, we have exited that postmodern epoch and we are now at the beginning of a new one. And we are, we are in chaos. We're in chaos in the same way as we were in chaos in the early 60s. And I'm sure the establishment in the early 60s, I saw all these hippies that were camping out in Woodstock, you know, and doing all this mad stuff and taking drugs, that this was the end of the world. And I'm sure there was this huge divide between the sort of conservatism of the establishment and the, the, the freaky outness of this new way of seeing the world. Well, that freaky outness has now become the establishment and the conservatives have become the freaky outness that are questioning stuff and being closed down by the ideology that's out there, right? That is a narrative. I'm not saying I believe that. I sort of do. But uh, I, 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 that is a narrative that we are living in now. And that prism is we then look through that prism that I've spent, you know, how much, like the half an hour explaining. And of course, this is my opinion. All this is is my view. Right, I'm sure people who know about philosophy are going, you've got Hegel wrong and you've got Herschel wrong and you've got the Frankfurt School wrong and Foucault didn't do that. And You're going to come in and say that. And my answer is, yeah, well, just tell me where I'm wrong and I'm going to question it. And if you can tell me where I'm wrong, I will change my position. Right, I promise you I will change my position. 
I have had like 38 years of these discussions with all sorts of different philosophers, all different scientists, all different artists for a number of years. And so my, my position has evolved. But here I am saying my position's evolved in this sort of Aristotelian, Hegelian way. And now I can't be, I don't really want to be budged on it. None of us do, especially when you get to my age. But you must, we all must be open to this negotiation. It's so important. Now, um, let me remind you of my central position again. And I'm really going to state it here. I don't think the negotiation between chaos and order is done well by philosophy. And all that continental philosophy that I've just described, Hegel, Herschel, Frankfurt School, Heidegger, the postmodernists, you know, Sartre, Foucault, Derrida, Barthes, all those philosophers really fundamentally goes back to Hegel and Hegel's idea of the negotiation of chaos and order. And he comes with this idea of this utopian, you know, um, this this is what you see in modern identity politics. It's utopian. These people believe they're working. They'll say that, you know, we should all be working towards this. Working towards what? This utopian world where everyone's equal and everyone's the same and nobody gets judged because of this and nobody gets judged because of that, you know. What about biology? There's no such thing as biology. Biology is a cultural construct. What about truth? There's no such thing as truth. Truth is a cultural context. What about cultural constru constructs? Is that true? Well, that's a cultural construct as well, I think. It's, it's, the whole thing has to be questioned. I think that negotiation between chaos and order, this is, this is all it is, right? I'm not a racist, I'm not a, I'm not a sexist, I'm not these things. What it is, I believe, that the realm to negotiate the, between chaos and order is the aesthetic realm and it should be done by artists and because artists will avoid, art avoids falling into the trap of thinking it's a science. They think that truth can be uh, elucidated by a phenomen phenomenological model of truth, which is my truth or your truth and that is truth. Right? I don't think that works. And artists can do that. And artists can deal with subjective reality, uh, our, our experience of things. It can deal with that in a way which um, does not get into the weeds of pretending it's a science or pretending it's truth. Truth and beauty, and beauty is about quality, and quality is about ethics and morality, and what's right and wrong. That is, for me, the realm of beauty. That's the aesthetic realm. And truth is about facts. It's about using a rational model. Now, anyone that's been indoctrinated into the, you know, the modern idea, ideology will turn around, not realising that they are speaking from a completely postmodernist perspective, and they will say, yeah, but science is a meta-narrative. That's just another meta-narrative. Yeah, and it's a bloody good one. You know, and the person who is talking to me over the internet or emailing me, or they're sat in their car that's driving at 70 miles an hour whilst listening to Spotify, that has all come out of that meta narrative. Everything that surrounds you, that supports you and makes your life as comfortable, has come out of the scientific meta narrative. That the way you would elucidate truth is you have this idea of objective truth, and through taking our subjective view away and having a scientific model which tries to eradicate that as much as we possibly can, we can get as close to the truth as we can, and that truth is continually renegotiated and refined by the 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 role of science and science is the technology, if you like, or the process that human beings have come to elucidate truth. But when we deal with beauty, and beauty is about the negotiation between chaos and order, right, we have the arts, not philosophy. Philosophy should just be the realm of logic, and logic is the mechanism by which we ju judge that scientific process. Anything else, just forget. Like Wittgenstein said, you know, we can't talk about this stuff. All, right? All we can do is try and make our, our checks of truth as refined as we possibly can. Now, that is my opinion. That is what I believe. It's quite simple. And that colours my view historically of when I look at music. So let's move on to my view of jazz or Prague or rock music. When I look at jazz, I find it very difficult to accept that there is a thing called black people, right? And black people have an essence, this sort of um, platonic essence that comes from Hegel, 
right, that they are essentially privileged or are not privileged, that white people are essentially privileged and they are essentially complete from a, a cultural context of the fact that they're white European or white American. I don't believe that exists. I just don't think it's a thing. The philosophy that uh, undergirds that, I don't believe is a thing, right? I am like a real liberal. I think there's individuals and individuals have to work with each other. And I think if you go up to a certain person, if you really truly don't want to be a racist, you want to deal with this person, you treat them as a human being. Right, not as a black person. As soon as you start saying, well, this is a black person and they're part of the tribe that invented jazz. Yeah, like, that person is a lot different to Buddy Bolden or Louis Armstrong or Duke Ellington. And Buddy Bolden, and Louis Armstrong and Duke Ellington, those three are all different people. Now, they have, the, the, the um, post nominists will argue, yes, but phenomenologically they're black. Right, of course there's no such thing as race, because everything's culturally constructed. Race is culturally constructed. No, it's not. It's biological. Race is biological. There are these very tiny genetic differences between, between us. And in some cases, they can um, uh, manifest themselves in a visually profound way. So tiny genetic change might give me black, you know, brown skin, as opposed to like pinky, you know, Piggy skin, like oh, you know, the, like we've got, you know, so, and that that slight difference or the slight difference in your eyes, that, those slight, those are very small differences. It's not like there's, then there's a, another race with three arms. These are tiny differences, but they are biological. It's not a cultural con construct. The the um, the cultural construct is is comes from a biological need for us to discriminate. Going right back to those tribes we were talking about, who were sat there with their magical music, worried about the next tribe coming over and taking all their women and all their food and all their animals. And so they had to recognize that tribe. And so it's, it's quite logical that, that us as human beings will have a terrible tendency to try and discriminate based upon visual appearance. And that happens all the time. Um, this idea that we're going to demark you know, race as being one of those, because there's a whole bunch of other things ugliness being an even bigger one you know if you're an ugly person your life's going to go a certain way and you've got no identity politic ideology come to come and help you you're just ugly and your life will go a certain way and it won't be as good as somebody who's not ugly you know if you're really deformed it's going to be even worse you re there's really going to be a prejudice against you you know, if you're really tall or you're really small or whatever it is, or you just look like you're grumpy, those things are going to have an effect on you. And because we, yes, culturally, we have demarked black people as being a certain thing, and that's the point I'm making. I don't think there's any use of looking at jazz and going, this is a black art form. Right? I just don't think there's any utility of doing that. Now, um, unless it's just a truth-based utility, unless it is the fact. Now, I've read into the history and read the history of blues. Blues is an Afro-American art form, but I'm just not sure that jazz is. The jury is out for me. I've accepted that dogma, but now really looking into it, I don't think it's the case. I think jazz is um, a music made out of Western harmony, with Western formal structures that come from classical music, it uses Western instruments and Western techniques. If we go back to the early beginnings of jazz, pre-1900, in New Orleans you've got bands of all different races making this music. There is an Afro-American element in there and it is basically the blues and the product of minstrelsy. And minstrelsy is obviously really influenced by a quite horrible white influence there. And, and the, the, the white idea of what Afro-American culture is, which is what minstrel is, this sort of culturally appropriated idea of it. We think that this is jungle music. That's in there too. So really, truly, it's the blues. And I've just stated, yeah, the blues is really important to the history of jazz. You can make jazz that is not have doesn't have blues in because jazz has got so much there formally that you can do it without that blues influence and there's loads of european jazz and loads of sort of free improvised jazz that where you know you can point to that even made by afro-americans if we look at anthony braxton he makes jazz which i don't think has any element of the blues in there a lot of the time um 
And so when I go back, I'm like going, where, where is this? It doesn't seem like this. The instruments they're playing, the form, the harmony, the chords, the techniques, all of this is coming from sort of American music. American music is this sort of hodgepodge of different folk forms, but really marching music, classical music, you know, all these things have been pulled in. And then when you look at the history, you start to see the evidence of that happening. You see, you know, the people who brought in sort of technique into jazz, and jazz is incredible art form because of the technical, you know, application of classical t technique within, Im within an improvised um, structure. Now you're gonna show, yeah, but what about improvisation? That's, well, where's that come from? Right, now, um, this is something that could be true or not true, right? I've deeply researched into this, and I'm going to tell you something that I don't know is true or not. I'm just going to tell you. There seems to be some evidence for this, but some not. Um, after the Civil War, Creole musicians were trained in classical music. Then when the Jim Crow laws come out, and um, those musicians weren't allowed to play classical music, but they were highly trained. Afro-Americans were. And so the Creoles are suddenly demoted down to being a, in a lower order, along with the Afro-Americans. So they have to go and work in those groups where they're highly trained. Afro-Americans come in, and um, also other musicians come into this, and they haven't got that training. So they play what's called head music. They're playing this stuff, but they're not readers. Now, Louis Armstrong read music. You know, Sidney Bechet read music. So don't put this on to the great Afro-American jazz musicians that, that then later in come in and turn this music form into an art form. Don't put it on to them. We're talking about a complete time, 1860, 1870, 1880, 1890. And these highly trained musicians, when these musicians came in that were sort of making it up, playing it by ear, and they, I don't think they're soloing going up to a point, this is they're just playing something by ear. Now that comes from all folk music. All of it is played like that, right? Um, these people would turn around and they would call musicians who were like that, they would say they were jackass. And there was an argument, and it could be apocryphal, that jazz isn't a sexual connotation term at all. It's, it's the abbreviation of jackass, jazz. That guy's a jazz, because he's making it up on the spot. Now, um, if we look at um, the, the evolution of the solo, right? That could well have its roots with Buddy Bolden. That seems to be, but I don't know, right? And um, Buddy Bolden was coming out of a group of musicians that was coming out of a guy called Papa Jack Lane. Papa Jack Lane had a white group in the 1890s. A lot of musicians either came out of that group or influenced that group. And Papa Jack Lane, and this is incredible, and this is why I make this point, because this is a beautiful thing, I think. Whatever jazz was, in New Orleans, whatever it was, at that time, in the Jim Crow, this music was an integration between Creoles, Blacks, Whites, Native Americans, a whole host of playing, despite the odds, were playing together. And that's what I mean by a negotiation. And I think jazz is that negotiation. And I think what happened, and this is the importance of our Afro-American musicians, is they took up, jazz existed at the turn of the century. I don't think it was, an, I'm whispering, so don't tell anybody, I don't think it was an Afro-American music form at all. Don't think its genesis was Afro-American. What happened was there was a whole bunch of people that were really important in turning this into an art form. And many of those are Afro-American. It's, it's, it's a testament to the individual brilliance of certain musicians. Freddie Keppard, King Oliver, Buddy Bolden, Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bechet, Jelly Roll Morton, Duke Ellington, Fletcher Henderson, right? Just go on like that. And all those people are individual musicians, okay? Um, I've had an argument with someone about the importance of the original Dixie Land Jazz Band. Um, I've said elsewhere there's a quote from Lee Armstrong that really um, 
he states that this was a really innovative band and it pushed jazz forward in terms of this sort of, it was like, Louis said, it was like an orchestra of jazz and they organised it. And the, the fact that they were organised this may be one of the reasons why they were chosen to, chose to record. The idea that they got recorded because they were white is not the case. Freddie Kepard was offered that. So there's a, there's a lot of it. I'm not saying I know this because we are looking through the mists of time. But what we don't want is to take the prism of an ideology that sees the world a certain way now and put it onto what was going on then because they were different then. It was different. You know, people's view of racism, people's view of prejudice was different. You know, racism was accepted back then. You know, um, Afro-Americans had to have a stoic acceptance of this. It was a rare person. And, and, and of course, in North America, you had educated um, Afro-Americans, highly educated. And they were, they were criticising what was going on. Duke Ellington is a product of that, you know, upper middle class, affluent, educated Afro-American. That's what Duke Ellington was. There's a difference between him and Louis Armstrong. And that has to be stated. And it's a positive thing. It's a po because what it shows is these people who, who existed in this awful society took what was around them and made individual artistic statements that were part of the negotiation that ends up in the 1960s with the civil rights movement, which has achieved so much for Afro-Americans. Now, does more need to be done? Yes, more needs to be done, but I don't want you to think I'm saying that from some idea that we're on this ideological utopian world where we should all be working to the, you know, emancipation forever and ever of every Afro-American. I just don't accept that's the case. I don't think that's what's going on. It's not that I don't think we should do that. I just don't think it happens like that. I am not a utopian. Utopia has never been achieved. And the societies that have tried to achieve utopia, whether it's the fascists or the Nazis, or, you know, the Stalinist Russia, or, you know, the Pol Pots, the Cambodia, Chairman Mao, what's going on in North Korea, all of these attempts to by force create a utopian society. If you believe that through anarchy we can achieve a utopian society, that, you know, that sort of, um, what's he called, the, um, the linguist? I can't remember his name. That sort of anarcho-syndicalism, you know, that somehow we can go back to the original idea and that will just be achieved by us all coming back into communes, you know, this sort of Rousseauian idea that, that, that everything was perfect before we, you know, invented like healthcare and science and pot noodles, all that. It was all much better than when we were running around in, you know, in caves, you know, just trying to stay alive. If you have that idea and it will just naturally come out of that, then I just don't, I don't believe that. And I don't believe it will happen. Right, I just don't, I and mean, you know, you'd have to argue me the, the way that would happen, because if you are an anarcho or an anarchist, or you believe that we can achieve some utopian, you know, you know, communist realm through that, then what are you going to do about me? Because I don't want to be a part of it. You know, um, I criticised BLM when they came out, and it was a very small criticism, really. I wasn't against their intentions. I wasn't against like the idea of of countering what was going on in America within the police force. And I think that the police force are trying to counter that and we should all work together to try and improve that. It wasn't that, it was when I read the BLM manifesto and I thought, I don't want to live in a commune where my kids are looked after somewhere else. I don't want that to happen. That's what they, that's what they believed. So I didn't, I didn't believe in what their values were. I didn't hate them. I didn't think they should be punished. I'm not against them. You know, if I met somebody in, in BLM who had that viewpoint, I would be friendly with them and I'd be interested and I, we could have a really good conversation. I'd try and counter them what they said. If they argued with me and I suddenly thought, oh yeah, this commune idea, this, this sounds like a really good idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it now. But at the moment, I just don't, I don't want to live in a commune where everyone looks after my kids. You know, I just don't want to happen. I don't want think that the family unit should be broken up because it's 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 embodies a sort of you know white supremacist meta narrative. I just don't think that is the case. I'm not against anyone who wants to believe it. People believe all sorts of things, you know, it's all sorts of weird stuff. And I've been friends with these people and I get on with them because we you know we're not we are not actually what we believe. The the world is wider and more richer than that. Because we're human beings and we live by that. 
you know, and if somebody comes up and you are sad and you have, you know, had a bad thing happen and they come up and they put their arm around you and they, you know, they put their arm on their shoulder and they say, don't worry, you're going to get through this. You know, thanks, you know, yeah, I promise you. It doesn't matter what their beliefs is. That is human kindness and we should be focusing on that more right, rather than trying to shut down someone else's opinion by often attacking their character, which I see over and over again. This is not right. It's absolutely not right. And if I get labeled a racist or a reactionary or right wing, which I am none of those things, I hope, because I have this opinion, then we are in a sorry state. And that is a, my critique of the prism in which we look at art and music. And I hope on this video, which is coming up to an hour long, and I know there's not been that that much discussion on music but I really wanted to state my claim hopefully this is something I, I, I don't think this video is going to get a lot of views but it's definitely a philosophy Sunday video um, I have riffed this I have made this up on the spot I have said throughout this video that I do not think that um, I do not think that um, my opinion is ideologically objective and I'm just talking absolute truth. I'm up for the ne negotiation. I have come here as a human being, stood in front of this camera and I have just chatted to you and said my opinion. If I've said things that aren't quite right or accurate, then just remind me. But the, let's just try and have a proper conversation here. Now, as we get to the end of this video, I've just filmed a video on awful album covers. And... Um, I've, for that video, I put that Lou Donaldson album. Is it Lou Donaldson? It is, isn't it? Lou Donaldson on an Elson album. So all the way through this, you've been watching me do this philosophical video. Some of you go, and he always puts an album in the background that, that, that relates to this. And you have been having to look at two bare bottoms all the way through this. And I apologise for that because I forgot. I didn't realise. I would have put something up, what, what, what can we put up in, let's get rid of the bare bottoms, right, we'll get rid of that and I'll put up um, a video, I'm going to put something in that space that I should have put up, what can I, what can I put up, um, that would, that would have some sort of, I'm having a look now, oh there's a good one, so let, let, let's be, that should have been there, philosophy, 100 essential thinkers, so I've got that thing representing the history of philosophy and how that's going to be the underlying theme of this video, not the bare bottoms, and dare I say, the, de the bare black bottoms, so please do not go judging me on the fact that those bottoms were there, it was a mistake, on my videos I make mistakes, I go wrong. You're, you're, that is the experience of watching my, one of my videos. It's inherent to my videos, right? I've come on here and I've spoken for an hour. It's mental gymnastics to try and do this, right? There's no editing, you know, there's no camera changing. I'm not cutting. I'm not going to put anything in this. It's just going to be me talking to camera. It's my opinion. My opinion is not gospel. It's just my opinion. If it's... Um, promote some thoughts in you or you get a feeling that I've touched on something that is worthy and worthwhile that was my goal achieved if not sorry you know you just wasted an hour of your life <laughs> and if you hate what I say and you're so angry then ask yourself what you're really angry about the fact that I've got a different opinion to you if that's the case that is just ugly anyway done drum kit the whole time. I'm sat behind my drums. Sorry about that awful drumming. I wasn't ready for it. Done. Finished. Like. Subscribe. Ring the notification bell. Go and click Patreon down there. Pay me a monthly sum. I'll put it in my bank. I'll spend it on stuff that I want to spend it on. But if you don't want to support me there because you've got no interest in what I do on Patreon, but you still want to support me because you're a nice person, go to my YouTube tip jar down there and stick some money in there as well. And I will appreciate that immensely. Okay? Brilliant. Do you want to see my drum kit? Do you want to see what I've been sat behind? I'll just, this, this is a strange video. Um, oh, I'll get up here and I'll move my camera back 
I've, I've set this I've set this little drum kit up in here and I'm sat behind I usually sat on a chair but I'm now sat behind this drum kit if I if I just get out the way and just angle it down that's what I'm sat behind and I've got a really titchy little 16 inch bass drum it's so cute it's so nice see I am a drummer really I'm finished now I'm done here I'm good did you enjoy that I bet I've gotten some I bet I've gotten some people's nerves though haven't I with this one what timing are we at we're at 59, let's, let's make it the hour. So um, this is on 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40. We've got 20 seconds to go. This is my anal retentive, you know, um, platonic need for perfection to try and make sure this video finishes on the hour. I always do this. I look at the time. I think we come, we've got eight, seven, seven seconds and then we'll be finished. Look, it's counting down. It's like life itself. Time is running out. The big emptiness.